attention to the government numbers, pay yeah. attention to the real numbers. Well, oh, okay, no. I, now I know where he keeps them. <laughs> I, I, I'm putting them everywhere I can. You don't see my socks? <laughs> Who wants the money? If you can follow the money, if you can figure out how the money is, what's happening, then you'll figure out a lot of the real stuff that's going on. I speak Chinese because, I, in my view, China is going to be the most important country in the 21st century. My next guest is 73 years old. He's a US citizen currently living in Singapore. He got his first job on Wall Street in 1964, eventually teaming up with the legendary investor George Soros in 1973, founding the Quantum Fund, which gained over 4,000% between 1970 to 1980, compared to the S&P index, which rose by 47% during the same time period. In 1980, he decided to retire and spend time traveling around the world by motorbike, in 1998, he founded the Rogers International Commodities Index, and he is the author of many books, including my favorite, Hot Commodities, How Anyone Can Invest Profitably in the World's Best Market. In his spare time, when he's not investing or raising his two children, he's also being interviewed by many of the world's media outlets. I'm talking about none other, billionaire investor Jim Rogers. Welcome to Project Civilization. Thank you, Marcus. So, Jim... How can you, what can you tell me about the activities of the world's central banks since the 2008 global financial crisis? Markets. Oh, gosh, they're going to ruin us. They never in recorded history have you had all the major central banks, Japan, Britain, America, Europe, printing staggering amounts of money. The Japanese said we will print unlimited amounts of money. That's their word. The Europeans said we will do whatever it takes, etc. They've gone nuts. They think they're saving us, but what they're doing is leading to eventual destruction of all of us. So we, we now have the ECB in negative interest rates as well as Japan. Do you believe that the US Federal Reserve will undertake more quantitative easing or negative interest rates over the next 12 months? Well, what will happen is Yes, they think that the Federal Reserve in America, the central bank in America has said they're going to get interest rates back to normal. They say they're going to do it very slowly. They don't mean it because what's going to happen, Marcus, is with next time we have a crisis or the appearance of a crisis, everybody's going to call up Washington. Okay. Now, in terms of real estate prices, in the UK, you've been quoted as saying that you definitely wouldn't invest in their property markets. But if we compare the UK housing market to the Australian housing market, according to economist Steve Keane, the Aussie housing market is even more inflated um, than the UK market. It's still rising and it's currently at 95% of GDP, whereas in the UK, prices are beginning to fall and their housing stock is only 70% of their GDP. So if we continue to look around the globe, Aussie housing debt is one and a half times what it is in America right now. And by the way, Jim, nearly half of Australian property mortgages are interest only loans. So Jim, are you bullish on the Australian housing market and where do you think it's heading? Well, Marcus, Australia is a gigantic country. It's the same size as the continental United States or China. So when you say property or housing, where? Yes, for the most part, prices, housing prices, in Australia are too high, overdone, and probably going to have a serious collapse. But I'm sure that if you find a right place at the right price, you'll do very well. I'm, I'm optimistic about agriculture. If you want to buy agricultural land in, in Australia, you'll probably do very, very well in the future. Now, in terms of the Australian banks, we have four major banks in this country which have three quarters of their balance sheets in consumption assets. Um, the Commonwealth Bank, for example, has over $800 billion on their balance sheet, which is more uh, than half of the Australian economy. Um, in my view, it's too big for the government to bail out if something goes wrong. So if Australia has a financial crisis, would you see that happening here? You say if said Australia has a financial crisis? Write it down, Marcus. We're all going to have a financial crisis sometime in the next two or three years. So when Australia has a financial crisis, there are going to be a lot of startling occurrences. You know, when the world starts having problems, you're going to see bankruptcies in China. Now, that's inconceivable to many people because China is this great magical growth country, and it has been. But that does not mean we're not going to have 
a crisis and bankruptcies all over the world, including Australia, America, China, you name it. Okay. Now, moving to currency for a moment, you've said that you're long the US dollar. Can you explain why? Well, I am, and, and uh, the main reason is because it, as turmoil comes to the world, people will seek a safe haven. That traditionally, the U.S. dollar has been a safe haven, so many people will put their money into the U.S. dollar to protect themselves. Now, the U.S. dollar is not a safe haven, I assure you, by any stretch, uh, Marcus, but since people think it is, and look around you, nobody's going to put their money in yen or some of the other potential currencies. So that's why I own the U.S. dollar. Now, it's, it's been a very strong currency for two or three years. It's having a correction now. But as the turmoil comes back, you're going to see the dollar go up again. Okay. Now, looking to precious metals like gold, you hold gold. You're not investing in gold right now um, because most of your money, I believe, is in, in U.S. dollars um, and you expect the U.S. dollar to appreciate. But what about people that have cash in non-U.S. dollars? Because if you're living in a country like Australia, if our currency falls relative to the U.S. dollar and the gold spot rate is priced in U.S. dollars, wouldn't that be a good buying signal? Well, in the circumstances you just described, of course, you're better off in gold than, than in, in other things, or maybe even in U.S. dollars. And by the way, I do own things besides the U.S. dollars. I own a lot of other stuff, including I even have a few Australian dollars, uh, mainly in the form of Australian stocks. I own some Australian shares. Uh, yes, yes, if you are in a country where your currency is under du stress or under duress, you need some way to protect yourself. That sometimes can be gold. It might be cotton. There are lots of ways you might protect yourself going forward. Now, I want to discuss a phrase with you, and it's called bail-ins. Uh, in 2014, the G20 meeting, which was held in Brisbane, Australia, uh, was rumoured to have discussed the possibility of bailing into bank accounts um, in the next financial crisis. Can you see something like this happening in Australia? Or uh, It's definitely going to happen. Most countries have now changed the laws so that if a bank gets into trouble, they can call on the depositors' money. They'll take innocent bystanders' money to help bail out or to save the bank. Uh, it's a little bit absurd, uh, given the way banking has evolved in the last 80 years or so, but now it is legal for nearly every country in the world to do something like that. Now, by the way, uh, Marcus, 100 years ago, that's the way it was. If you put your money in the bank, and the bank failed, you were at risk. You could lose everything, lose all of your deposits. That's the way banking traditionally was. It's only been in the last 100 years, or so, well, not 100 years, uh, 80, 90 years, where people have come up with ways to protect share of, of depositors. But historically, that was the way it was done. None of us expect that now because the way banking has evolved, but it certainly has happened for thousands of years. Okay. Now, moving on to the definition of free markets, in Australia, the current political party in government is the Liberal Party, and their values lie in the concept of having free markets. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem to me like we can have a truly free market if we have central banks regulating interest rates and the, quant the quantity of money in circulation. And what's even more frightening to me is the fact that there's been so much media coverage on how the world's markets are being rigged. Um, the LIBOR market, for example, which is the average interest rate calculated through submissions of interest rates by major banks across the world, we've seen banks convicted and pay fines in the millions of dollars, such as the Royal Bank of Scotland, UBS and BNP. Even the Australian banks, such as the ANZ, are currently under investigation by ASIC for their involvement in the LIBOR rigging scandal. And so far, the only Aussie Perth banker has been, only one Aussie Perth banker has been charged and a few others around the world and nobody's gone to jail. Then we have the Forex market rigging, the gold market, the silver market, the housing market, the commodities market, the bond market. So Jim, how deep are the world markets entangled in fraud and rigging and in your view and how does this affect your ability to make trading decisions? Well, most of the rigging you're talking about, if it exists or if it has existed, is of short-term nature. Uh, the guys who were con uh, accused of rigging interest rates were not accused of changing interest rates from, you know, 15% in America down to zero. That's not what they're accused of. They're accused of very short-term manipulation 
of interest rates. That may affect you and me once if we happen to trade in the short term when they're making interest rates artificial. But overall, nobody can, can manipulate the, the market you're talking about, the currency markets, the interest rates market, oh, uh, except for a few minutes or even a few hours or so, you might be able to. But these markets are much too big for anybody to manipulate on an ongoing basis. You said housing. Yeah, well, all of these markets are being rigged by governments. Now, governments can certainly rig currencies, and they do. And they have the power to rig them for more than a few minutes. And often they try. Usually, in the end, the market has more money than the government. Okay, so moving on to a more philosophical discussion, I want to discuss civilizations with you and whether they can last. The, the French philosopher Voltaire once said that history is the repeating uh, simple repeating of hobnail boots ascending stairs and silk slippers deascending stairs. And then in the 1970s, we had the British soldier, Sir John, Lieutenant General Sir John Glubb, who wrote a paper called The Fate of Empires and the Search for Survival. In that paper, he said that all living civilizations are living empires and they have a start and an end date typically lasting 10 generations or 250 years. Um, he defined the cycle of empires into six stages, beginning with pioneering and ending in bread and circuses in the age of decadence. Some common elements of the age of decadence is the debasement of currency, uh, a communal sense of entitlement, and a bloated state costing more money than what it brings in through taxation. Now, here we are in 2016, and the world balance sheets seem to be on par um, with the final stages of empire. So, Jim, do you believe that our civilization is going to fix its problems and continue? Because in the case of the Roman Empire, after they collapsed, their population was reduced from a million people down to about 18,000, heralding in the beginning of the Dark Ages, which lasted around 400 years. Quite a long time to be hiding under a rock. What do you say? Well, Marcus, you've answered the question. It, no, no empire has lasted. It's always, it's always happened, just like no family has lasted. No company has lasted. I mean, everything has a life of its own. It rises and then it falls. And no empire, no country. I mean, in one of my books, I talk about the fact that I, I can know, I know of no country where the, the borders and the government has stayed, stayed stable for as long as 200 years. Everything changes and always has and always will. But that does not mean, that Marcus, that some people won't be getting better. There are always people on the rise while there are always people on the decline as well. Moving on to the subject of oil, more specifically peak oil, you've been quoted in the media as saying uh, a good opportunity will be coming to invest in oil once again after, because it's taken such a beating in the markets. But longer term, it seems to me that we're in really big trouble. Shell Oil says the world will be out of oil by 2070. None of the governments around the world have successfully tackled transforming our energy supply from fossil fuels to renewables. And then there's the issue of doing it in a way that's cheap, because as you know, what really underpins our way of life is cheap energy. So do you think the breaking of our economic system, apart from economics itself, uh, could occur when we can no longer extract the daily volume of oil out of the ground to satisfy global supply? And before your answer, Jim, if you consider that our former Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, once said that at higher oil prices, um, suddenly other alternatives become viable. Um, but that all assumes that we can um, magically bring on stream alternatives in such volumes to bridge the gap. And I think that kind of just-in-time thinking is rather risky. What say you? Well, if, if he can bring new sources of energy on stream instantly, perhaps, but no one has ever been able to do that. Technology takes a while to develop and to become cost efficient, etc. But to your point, known reserves of oil have been declining all over the world for several years, except for frackers. But now the frackers, of course, cannot make money. They have to have very high prices. And fracking, of course, doesn't work everywhere. So unless something happens, we are going to face, quote, a, a hydrocarbons crisis sometime in the next century. Now, maybe there are a lot more hydrocarbons out there. We just don't know where they are yet. Maybe there are many other kinds of energy which can be brought on. But all of this other kind, all these other kinds of energy are very expensive and not competitive, not economically competitive yet. They might be someday. But this is, this is something that takes years, sometimes decades, before it really works.
Now, population, specifically overpopulation, is the world overcrowded now, Jim, with people all wanting a Western lifestyle? And what's your views on how we are affecting the planet and its resources? Well, everybody wants to live a better life. There's no, no, I mean, obviously some people, like, their lives cannot get much better because they have everything that they want or they can dream of. But nearly all of us in the world want a better life. We all want to live like the people on the televisions uh, everywhere. But we're not overcrowded. The world is not. You say, well, are we overcrowded with people who want to improve their lives? No, there's no such thing as being overcrowded. People want to improve their lives. There's seven billion of us. We all want to improve our lives, and we should, and that's how civilization and societies make progress. But is the world overcrowded? No. Marcus, there are gigantic empty places in the world. Don't worry. We're not going to all suddenly die for lack of space. Okay. Now, moving along to sound money, which is a topic that really interests me. Um, I interviewed Professor Steve Keen a few weeks ago, um, who would like to see a modern debt jubilee for the private sector, followed by an overhaul of the financial system, um, which would place new regulation on banks to stop them creating asset bubbles again uh, in the future. Now, Steve is not for a gold standard under any circumstances. Um, he said gold is regarding money as a commodity, and money's never been a commodity except for when there's trust issues uh, between warring empires. He said that the crisis now is the shortage of money, and people need to understand money, and money is the easiest thing in the world to create, but it's not being created by the banking sector because it's created too much already, and it's not being created by the governments because they have an obsession with trying to run a surplus. So, Jim, in your view, would you like to see a gold standard reintroduced or overhaul the existing system in line with Steve Keen's views? First of all, the gold standard has never worked. No standard has ever worked uh, indefinitely because politicians always figure out a way to get around it and to screw the public or to cheat the public. You know, the, the Roman, many, every civilization that's tried silver, gold, whatever, eventually it has failed and changed to something else. The only thing that really would work and has worked uh, in, in history is to have an open market in money. If you and I want to use sugar cubes as money, we do it. If other people want to use feathers, they use feathers. But eventually, the market sort of determines what most people use as money, and then the market can always adjust. If we run out of birds, we don't use feathers anymore, you know, whatever it happens to be. That kind of system has always been able to survive. The problem, of course, is the politicians don't like that because they don't control it. And so then the politicians would come up with regulations and controls to make their money the monopoly or give their money the power so that they have more power. But if the, if the world just had a free market and money and we could use anything we want, as has often been the case, we would, it, would, it would survive. It wouldn't have a problem. And politicians and governments couldn't cheat us as much as they do. Okay, so... Now, moving to China, Jim, you've said that you believe the 21st century belongs to China. You've also said that China seems to be doing all the right things. But, Jim, I just have this gut feeling inside me that says China won't go down in history as being an economic miracle. I've been there a number of times before on business, and I've seen their gigantic ghost cities, which is in line with their gigantic money printing. And that money is now rapidly moving over to Australia. Uh, especially into real estate, not to mention the rest of the world. Um, China has been the, um, the production house for the world for a long time now, which I think is a flawed economic model. So does Donald Trump, um, who seems to be, want to do something about it at least. Um, and then you have China's political system. It's communist, which will most likely come back to bite them in the ass one day. Um, and they have a history of civil uprising and revolutions. So... Yes, they've looked fantastic over the past 30 years or so, but haven't we been here before? Japan was the poster child once before too, and look at them now, they're a basket case. So what makes you so confident that China will continue to prosper? Um, could World War III end their success run? And wouldn't this be a problem if people do what you say and invest into agriculture on the assumption that Asia is going to continue expanding? And if we have another worldwide depression, that could also last for decades. Well, it certainly could, and it probably will, uh, and it would probably lead to World War III. I'm not sure who's going to win World War III, 
uh, first of all, nobody wins wars, even the people who think they do, because they lose massive amounts of capital and people and everything. Everything gets destroyed. So even the winners wind up being losers in wars. And that's why wars have never been good for, for anything except, well, except commodities. Commodities go up during, during wartime. It's not a reason to start a war. Uh, China is the only country in recorded history that's had recurring periods of greatness. Uh, great Britain was great once. Rome was great once. Egypt was great once. But China has been great three or four times. They've been at the absolute pinnacle of the world of world history. They've also collapsed. They've had three or four periods of absolute catastrophe and disaster. But they're the only country that after disaster turns itself around and then rises to the top again. There will be setbacks along the way, uh, Marcus. Don't think there won't. America was the most successful country in the 20th century, but we, as we rose, we had 15 depressions with a D. We had a civil war. We had very few human rights. We had massacres in the streets. We had very little rule of law, and yet we became a reasonably successful country in the 20th century. China's going to have plenty of problems. Don't think they won't. You're going to see bankruptcies in China in the next few years, which is going to surprise and uh, shock a lot of people. But China is the only country I can see out there that's got the wherewithal to be the next great country in the world. I don't see anybody else, uh, any other competing nation. Okay, so my second last question is, uh, is trading an honorable pursuit? Some people believe traders or even day traders are lazy, but can you explain to people how the role of traders affects markets and commerce? Well, you certainly need traders, whether you're sitting in a, in a city in Africa where people got to get bananas and oranges and clothes. They, those are traders in their own way. I, you're talking about stock market traders and the markets need, well, traders are good for markets because they add liquidity. Uh, and all markets, the, the more liquidity, the better. Even those you know, markets in the outback in Africa need liquidity. Everybody needs liquidity. So the more the more liquidity, the better. Uh, is it an honorable profession? Of course it is. Is selling, selling T-shirts in African markets an honorable profession? Of course it is. Then financial instruments is also honorable and it pr provides liquidity. Are they lazy? I don't know. I, I wouldn't be able to do it because it's very hard work, for me anyway. But if, if people can do it and not have to work at it, then I guess maybe they are lazy. I would not be able to do it. Uh, I'm all for the more traders, the better, and the more uh, devices, by devices, I mean instruments, the more instruments, the better. I totally agree. So my last question, Jim, suppose somebody watching this is earning, say, $1,500 per week, and they have some cash saved away, um, allowing for time delays to actually making money and assuming there's not too many losses along the way. Um, what would you be suggesting a working capital base uh, should be for a person uh, in order to have a go uh, in making re re replacing their weekly income uh, if they were doing options or commodities trading? Well, people should not do anything in financial markets unless they know what they're doing. It's most people in financial markets lose money. And reason for that is most of them don't know what they're doing. If you figure out what you know a lot about, and can do it, then you will probably be successful at it. But I mean, if you know a lot about coal, you can probably invest in coal and make money. Whereas most of us who don't know enough about coal will make so many mistakes that we will give you opportunities. So if you know what you're doing, or better still, figure out what you know the most about, stay with it, and then you can become an investor. How much you invest is up to you. If you're good at it, stop doing everything and just trade. Just invest, invest your money in the things that you know. And if you have the discipline and the knowledge to stay with what you know, you'll be very successful. You don't need a job. Forget whether it's 1500 a week or 1500 a, a day. Uh, you know, if you're good at trading, you'll make a lot of money. Fantastic. Well, that concludes this uh, interview. If you're interested in any of Jim's books, they're available at Amazon uh, or in audio form from audible.com. Jim Rogers, good luck with all of your investments and thank you for taking the time to be here today. Thank you, Marcus. Bye-bye.